Uh, when I think about the best people that I've ever met, bar none, it's Christians. Christians are the best people I've ever met. I look throughout my life and I can uh, see people who've done incredible things for me and they're all people who are in Christ. I remember when I was in Houston and this great ice storm went through a couple of years ago. I think you guys got it too up here. And it shut down Texas because Texas isn't used to that kind of weather, especially that far down south. But I woke up one morning and it was 48 degrees in my house because the power was out. So I put on my ski clothes and about seven layers and I immediately went into survival mode. I started rationing my kitchen, which you can imagine a single guy's kitchen is not great. So I was like, OK, I got I can eat an apple a day and a bag of Doritos and I can maybe make it eight, nine days and I'm going to be just fine. Yeah, it's sad. I know. I start rationing. Ten minutes later, I hear a big honk, and there is a brother in Christ named Chris Ball in his big old truck who braved all the ice on the roads to pick me up, and I got Whataburger. I got a hot meal, a hot shower, and a nice bed the whole entire week because uh, my power was out for three days. I remember living in Elk City, and my alternator died as I was driving home, and there was an elder who's, who's passed. I missed that brother. His name was Dan Felton. And he heard about my truck, and so he drove, picked me up, went, bought me an alternator, came back, and he helped me install it. Now, I can't teach you how to do that because I'm not good with cars, but he took care of the whole thing because that's the kind of guy he was. I think about when I was in Denver, Colorado. I was 20 years old. It was the first holiday I was ever going to be away from family. Uh, it was Thanksgiving, and I couldn't make it home. There was too much work to be done. And there was Corey and Melody Sawyers who invited me over for Thanksgiving. And I was really appreciative to be there, but I was incredibly sad because my entire family was going to be here and more, and I wasn't going to get to be there. But I remember walking in, and they said, hey, come on in. We hug, and I said, it's good to see them. And they said, hey, come in the kitchen. And they pulled down the oven, and in the oven is my grandma's famous potato casserole. And this thing is something of legend, okay, in my family. And I, was, I never thought I would cry over potatoes, but I cried over potatoes that day. Christians are the best people. And I don't know about your life, but I hope you can say the same thing. The last few weeks in the series we've been doing together called This Is Us, we've been trying to figure out who we are as a people. What are we as the Choctaw Church of Christ all about? And we've been basing this off the text that was just read to us in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. And if you have your Bible, you can open up to there. I promise there is an end in sight to this series. We won't be here forever. But when you read this passage of these Christians, they sound like an amazing people, don't they? With the way they treat with one, an one another, the way they act towards one another. This is a great group of people. I believe it's a people you would be amongst and say, man, these people are the best. They're a great group of people, and we long to be like them. So far in this study, we've talked about how we are, well, what, first we said why there's in us. It's only because of Jesus that we've been brought together to be this people. And we discovered how we are devoted, or we're all in, in all of these areas we've been studying, and one of those was healthy teaching. We're all in on healthy teaching, the words of God. And last time we studied this subject, we talked about how we're a family. Not in name only, but in how we treat one another. That we have been made family in Christ, and so we should be amongst each other, spending time together, looking out, being mindful and intentional for one another. And this morning, as you look at this verse or this passage, and we read it one more time, I want you to clue in on verse 45 and ver verse 46 as we read the, the whole passage in its entirety. So in verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. As we look at this passage and we pull out really four characteristics of us as a church and what we're all about, and we're on the third one this morning, I think we see the truth that when it comes to who we are, we are generous. We're a generous group of people. That's what God calls us to be. 
He calls us to be a people who are giving, who sacrifice for one another, who go above and beyond what might be normal or required to help those who are in need, to bless other people. Jesus has blessed us, not for us to keep it within ourselves, but He has blessed us to be a blessing. And that's what I want to talk about with you for a brief moment this morning. This morning we have simple, simply two points and then a few thoughts about how we can be generous as a group of people. And the first is simply this. Notice that the early Christians were generous. They're a generous group of people. There's a few phrases in verse 45 I want you to notice. As they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Notice that first part. Selling their possessions and belongings. That's how it's written in the ESV. But some of you reading your Bible and its translation this morning, it might say something a little different. It might say their property and their possessions. When I read it in the ESV, I just thought of knickknacks and household items. It almost came across like a garage sale in the first century. You know, maybe they were given their old Pokemon cards and patio furniture and the clothes that no one fit. I, that's not really what it was. But it's property and possessions. That's really more of an accurate translation there. We see this truth in a similar passage. We haven't turned to this yet in our study, but in Acts chapter 4, there's a very similar picture of the church in Jerusalem that's painted. In Acts chapter 4, if you read starting in verse 32, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that anything, any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. If you thought Ananias and Sapphira's story was weird in Acts 5, back up. And it starts to make a little more sense as you see what's going on. But notice, this is not a, simply a garage sale. They were selling things of value in their home. And they were selling more than just items. They were selling property. They were selling real estate for one another. Can you imagine that? Selling homes, selling acres, selling things of this kind of value for the simple fact of I want to help my brothers and sisters in Christ. Not that I'm going to get something material in return, not because it's the value shot up and I'm going to make more money off it, but I'm going to sell this to help my brothers and sisters in need. It says there that they distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. They were doing this for those in need. That's the qualifier. And why were people in need at this time? Well, remember the context of the story we've been looking at. It's the day of Pentecost. The, the pilgrimage has come where people from uh, devout Jews of under, uh, under heaven of from every nation have come to this one central location. And they've come here and they're away from their jobs. They're away from homes. They're away from businesses. Many of them would need help and hospitality to survive. And the Jews, were, the Jews had a custom of tremendous hospitality during these pilgrimages. Um, all visitors were received into private homes. No one could charge for giving a bed or for food. Uh, they were to supply the basic needs and, and to provide because that's, that was the law. That was what God had called them to be, the hospitable people. And what we see the Christians doing in Acts chapter 2 is they take this great hospitality during this custom or during this pilgrim, pilgrimage feast and they start doing it daily. They extend it. They even add to it. And they continue to help their brothers and sisters in need. And they take this hospitality and they just add upon it. And so as needs would arise for their brothers and sisters, as they found them out, they would sacrifice things of their own. They would sell items from, of their own that would have value to benefit their brothers and sisters. You might wonder, is the all there, the people they're helping, is that Christians or non-Christians? Well, from this passage and the context of what's going on and from Acts 4, my guess is that it seems to be brothers and sisters in Christ. It appears they're doing this for the family of God. That doesn't mean they weren't charitable or a helpful giving people to those who weren't in Christ. But I could also be wrong on that. Either way, they're a generous people, aren't they? 
I mean, this is a giving people. I, I can't imagine selling my home just to help someone else. Have you ever downsized your house to help someone else afford their rent? Can't even imagine that in our society. But yet in this unique situation, you find them doing things just like that. They took it upon themselves. It says they, day by day, they broke bread in their homes. We talked about that last week, some of how, how much time, or last week, whenever it was, spending time outside these walls, eating with one another, being together. And they were, but they housed each other. I mean, they were providing. This is another level of giving and hospitality. As I was looking up definitions of generous, I loved this one because... If, if I were to call you a generous person, what does that mean? Or if I was to say, this is generous, what does that mean? It might be different in different contexts. For example, if I'm standing in Chipotle or Qdoba and I say this is generous, I mean they gave me a big scoop of rice and they didn't cheat me on the protein. You know what I'm talking about if you've been to one of those places. right? In terms of food, generous is, hey, here's a scoop and a little more. Here's extra. Let it overflow. What does it mean when we say we're generous? Well, I love this definition. It's a readiness to give more of something than is necessary or expected. Would you say these Christians are generous? Are they not giving more than what's necessary or expected? They're giving up things of value for nothing in return. I think we would be around these people if, if we were there in that moment, we would say, this is an incredible group of people. Some of the best people I've ever met. They are giving. They are generous. It shouldn't surprise us that the verses following their generosity say this. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Those people were saved because they heard the gospel. They heard the truth and they believed it, sure. But it's also because the people that they were seeing live out this faith were generous. They're attractive. Wouldn't you want to be a part of a family like that? Wouldn't you be amazed at a people who live like this? Wouldn't you want to know more about the God that calls them to be like this or the God that's motivated them to be this giving, to be this generous? And so people were attracted and they see the generosity. They might have experienced the generosity and they add to this. They hear the gospel message. We had a brother in our Bible class this morning say, sometimes we have to help the needs of people physically before we can help their spiritual needs. And, and that's probably maybe what's happening here. But they're generous. And the question is, how did they become so generous? And our second point this morning is this. They learned generosity from God. We serve a generous God. Don't we? Isn't our God a giver? And He goes above and beyond to give us good gifts. Uh, from the first page in Scripture to the last and everything in between, you find a father who loves his children, a father who blesses and blesses and then some, a God who provides, a God who gives. There's five Old Testament stories I think of when it comes to the generosity of God. Think of creation. God not only created a magnificently beautiful world for our dwelling place, but He created us with just the right collection of senses to enjoy it, to take it in. This beauty that we see, the things we taste, the things we experience, He created us to enjoy it. And on top of that, He created this world in a way that it points to Him and reveals His character and His nature. But we get to enjoy a wonderful earth when He created it in the beginning it was a place overflowing with abundance. It was fruitful, it was beautiful, and it was designed for individuals to live an abundant life. God's generous. Think about the covenant. We talked about Abraham in our Bible class this morning. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 12 through 3, 12 through 3 God told Abraham, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham did nothing to deserve this wonderful promise that God had given to him. He was a faithful man, yes, but it wasn't as if Abraham was some person who earned this great covenant with God. This covenant happened because of God's generosity, because God was giving 
It wasn't because of who Abraham is. It was because that's who God is. He's generous. Think about freedom from slavery. Generosity is what caused God to raise up Moses and harness the forces of creation. Staying faithful to the promises that he had made before to Abraham and his descendants. The Lord in this, in this moment of freedom, of freeing his people from slavery, he unleashed his almighty power in a display the world had never seen before. And he rescued his children from captivity. He defeats an army of Pharaoh uh, on the way. And God was generous. When God is generous in his promises, he is generous in the use of his power to fulfill them. He's a, good, he's a good, good God. Think of the law. You and I might not think of the law as generous. That might say something about how we interpret law. But when God led the Israelites out of slavery, they were destitute, they were traumatized, they were powerless, they were ungoverned, they lived in a fractured culture because of everything they had experienced around them. They didn't know how to live so what does God do in his generosity? Well, he blesses them with one of the most practical gifts, law. Here's how you live and function. Yes, the Lord had the right to command their obedience, but the law is a testament to the extent of generosity of God's love. He is sympathetic and understanding to our needs, and he's generous. Think of the promised land. I have a place for you, overflowing with milk and honey. When the spies go to spy out this land, they come back in Deuteronomy 125 and say, it's a good land that our Lord is giving us. And you know how they celebrated this wonderful promise of God giving them this great land? They turn away from him over and over and over and over again. And they fail him. And what does God do? Well, he, he continues to hear their cry. And he redeems them over and over again. He still blesses this nation even when they fail. In this land would be a palace and a temple and generations who were born into prosperity. And that's because God is not just generous in fulfilling his promises, but he is also generous in his patience. We have a generous God. And if you go back to Acts chapter 2 and you look at this picture of a generous church, you think, where did they get this from? Well, they got it from their father. It should be of no coincidence that you find a people who are living this way right after they find out that God has done the most generous act of all time by sending himself in the form of man to endure pain, to be despised, to experience death for our sin. God gave everything for you and I. God gave everything for this people. Shouldn't they be willing to give in return? Shouldn't you and I be willing to give in return for a God who's given everything for us? The early church was generous because God had been generous with them. And so when we think about who we are, and we've talked about having healthy teaching, and we've talked about being a family, we also need to understand what we're all about is we're a generous people. We give and we sacrifice for the needs of others. We're a people who don't see what we have in life as our own, but it's a blessing from God that we are intended to have to bless others with. We're a people who go above and beyond what is, is expected or required because God has gone beyond what's expected or required. And the question really becomes, how are we going to be a generous people like that? How do we become this type of generous? And I think there's a few things. If we're going to become generous like this church, we have to believe that we are rich in Christ. If you ask people what it means to be rich today, I know what they'll tell you. You know, a bank account with seven zeros in it, a garage filled with cars and toys, a big old house. They'll tell you all the stuff they have. I got a home and a vacation home and a vacation home and I have like three Airbnbs. I'm rich. I got it all. What it really means to be rich is to have Jesus Christ in your life. What it really means to be rich is to have touched glory by being saved by the blood of Jesus, to have an everlasting relationship with God, to know he has blessed us beyond anything we could have physically in this life. We have to believe we're rich in Christ, even if our bank account is low, even if our neighbors have the newer toys, 
Even if we don't have the nicest house or the nicest stuff, we are richer than everyone else in the world. And that's not a braggadocious statement. It's a statement about how good God is and how great it is to be in Jesus. We have to believe we're rich. Because if we don't believe we're rich, we're likely not going to sacrifice and give for other people. We're going to think we need to take more and more. And there's not enough for everybody. But God has given us enough in his son. And so we have to believe we're rich in Christ. Secondly, we have to be willing to let go. Do you know the story about the rich young ruler? Came to Jesus. Lord, you know, what else must I do? I, I've, I've done all, everything the law says. I, I've, I've done it perfectly. And Jesus told him, you know, sell your possessions and give to the poor. He wasn't willing to do it. It says he walks away sadly. He wasn't willing to let go of all the things he had stored up in his life. We have to be willing to let go. When we give, we lose something. The moment we give, we lose. When we give our time to somebody, we can't get that back, can we? When you give your money, you can't just get that back. I mean, unless they say they borrow it, but even then sometimes they don't give it back. But when we give, we can work up for more, but we can't get that moment back, and we have to be okay with that. We have to be willing to let go, because when we give, we lose. But here's the catch. We gain so much more than what we've lost. We gain so much more than what we've given. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is a blessing to us, and we have to be willing to let go. We have to believe there's enough and that God provides and to be content with what we have. We, we do this thing sometimes where we, we get more and more and we just stack up everything we have in life. We need to be willing to part with some of that sometimes. It's hard. We live in a very materialistic culture and society. I mean, I, I'm part of it too. And it's, it's a struggle at times to, to see how rich we really are. We have to be willing to let go, whether that's time money, our services, whatever it may be, to help other people. If we're going to be a generous people, we have to look for needs. We have to be people who are looking for needs. There are needs all around us. You know, we drive by people and we stop at stoplights and these stop signs and we see people holding up signs and they're in need and we see those and they're obvious. But I'll tell you, there's more people than just them who are in need all around us. There are people right now in this very room who are in need. There are people right now who could use help financially. There are people in here who could use help emotionally. There are people in here that it would mean the world to them if you'd spend an hour helping them around the house this weekend. There are some people here who need, who have great needs. And as a church family, it's our responsibility to look for them, to see their need, and be prepared to fill it. This, this somewhat piggybacks on our last lesson of it's hard to know people's needs if you don't know them. That's why we need to know each other. And I, I know it's difficult, but if you are in need in this family, I hope you'll share it. Because what's not going to happen is that we're going to look at you and say, how could you have that need? Or why do you have that need? But it should be, I'm so thankful that I can bless you and help you as my brother or sister. How sad would that be if we help everyone, everyone's needs, but we don't help our own? We have some people who might be in need. Let's look for them and be willing to fill them. And if we can't fill them, we can point them or find somebody else in our family who can. Let's look for those needs. And then lastly, if we're going to be generous, it has to become a habit. Generosity does not happen by accident. Being these kind of people doesn't happen by giving Every four or five months or every six months or doing a good deed once a year, that's not how it works. You have to make it a habit. This morning when we passed those plates, all of, all of you with children and grandchildren, how many of you gave them coins or a dollar? Why did you do that? Was it because they need to pay their tax to the church? <laughs> no, probably wasn't even their money, was it? You're trying to develop within them a habit that says we give back to God. We're giving people. This is the standard. And in the same way we do with our kids, hoping that when they grow up, they will give on a weekly basis, that they'll be sacrificial. We have to make generosity a habit. We have to say, I'm going to make it a plan to provide a meal every couple of weeks or once a month. I'm going to make it a plan 
to give an hour each week to somebody in need around their house. I'm going to make it a plan to volunteer for that ministry work uh, every month. I'm going to make it a plan to give, prepared to give, not what's left over, not if I have the extra time after, but I'm going to give because God has been so generous. If we're going to be a generous people, it has to become habit. And so my challenge for us this week, because we only start becoming these kind of people, this kind of people if we become generous or we do generous things. This week, look for a need and fill it. It doesn't have to be money. It can be your time. It can be services and not get anything in return. It could be providing a meal. It could be going and spending an hour with someone just listening to them. It could be a variety of things. But go look for a need and fill it, whether it's in our own family, whether it's in the community around you, but do something for someone else, not for what you get in return, but for, what, but for what you've gotten in Jesus. Jesus was willing to give everything and not get anything in return. He died on the cross for many people who would never respond to him in the way he desired, yet he died anyway. And we need to be willing to give even if people will never give back, even if they'll never listen to what we have to say. I'm willing to give because Jesus is generous. We are a generous people. We're a generous family. And that's who we should aspire to be every day, every week. And how wonderful would it be if Choctaw said, the Choctaw Church of Christ, that's a generous group of people. That's a people who give and they go beyond the limit. They go beyond what's required. They're great people and you should go check them out. Let's be generous this week. Let's look for a need and let's fill it. This morning... We didn't necessarily talk about the gospel, but we have talked about the generosity of our Lord. He's given everything to have a relationship with you and I. He's done everything possible to show you that he loves you and he wants to spend forever with you, that he wants to bless you in a way that you can't even imagine on this earth. Have you responded to him? Have you given your life back to him in return? He wants nothing more than that. And this morning, if we can help you become a Christian, if we can help you respond to his generosity, we would love to help you by faith put him on in baptism. It might be that this morning that you're just struggling and you want prayers, and we would love to, to love on you and encourage you this morning and to be generous towards you. It might be this morning you actually have a need that needs to be helped. And you don't have to come forward this morning and ask for that, but would you please find one of us and let us know your need? Because we don't want you to leave these doors with a need and us not help you. We want to be people who see needs and provide. This morning, we are generous people. I hope that makes sense to everyone. I hope you followed along. And let's go be that kind of people and that kind of family this week and every week. If you have a need this morning, come now while we stand and while we sing.